hey, I would definitely do that, and I have done that, and I will. Don't do that. We are the Armed Attorneys. Today we're talking about another domino lining up in the gun grabbers playbook. This relates to how we as law-abiding gun owners are able to legally ship our firearms across the United States. It's actually kind of a big change that flew under the radar and we have to talk about it. But before we begin, show your support for the Second Amendment by hitting that like button. Now, we all kind of know there have been legal ways to ship firearms across the United States. And so we kind of have to start with that baseline first. We start our baseline with the general federal law that prohibits, with exceptions, the mailing of firearms if you're a private individual. This is located in 18 U.S.C. 922 A2A, and there are exceptions if we, just as private persons, want to mail firearms interstate. Just generally speaking, I should be able to go mail a firearm directly to a licensed importer, a licensed manufacturer, a licensed dealer, or a licensed collector. So hypothetically, I should be able to take my handgun and have that mailed to um, an FFL dealer out of state, perhaps back to the manufacturer. However, um, you know, we have to take that federal law and we also have to look at practicalities, right? The law is going to be divided up between handguns and long guns. And then practically speaking, we have different ways of mailing and shipping, right? We've got United States Postal Service, and we've got our common carriers like FedEx, UPS, DHL. So I think, Richard, let's start with United States Postal Service, yep. and let's talk about handguns first. How do we go about deciding whether or not we can take our handgun or long gun to the United States Postal Service for shipping? Tell me. So the primary consideration of whether you can ship something through the USPS, the United States Postal Service, is whether the firearm is concealable. So those are our pistols, handguns, our short-barreled rifles, and our short-barreled shotguns. You can't, even if you wanted to, ship those through United States Postal Service. It's prohibited by law. Now, what kind of prompted this whole discussion is kind of a controversy with UPS. You know, Brown, what can Brown do for you? Them. Um, you can check out our friends over at Washington Gun Law. He has a great breakdown on that. Our Iraq veteran, 8888 Eric, uh, over on his channel, they have discussions about that. But there's another kind of key component to this that's kind of sneaky and flew under the radar, and that's really what we're getting at. Mm -hmm. But pistols, you know, short barrel rifles, short barrel shotguns, can't do that through USPS. Uh, the only thing you would be legally allowed to ship is long guns. Now, there's um, a little bit to doing this legally, though. Yeah, and the post office actually gives you a little bit of a breakdown for mailing your long guns. There are just rules you've got to follow. But generally speaking, this is going to be lawful so long as, you know, you are complying with federal, state, and local law otherwise, right? Complying with the interstate mailing rules or complying with your own intrastate mailing rules. You're going to perhaps be required to open them, give written certification that the weapon is unloaded, that it's not concealable. Um, they are not going to want to mark on any of the outside of the packaging what's in there, which makes perfect sense to me, right? But you'll see this list of rules um, generally very straightforward. So that's your USPS. No handguns, nothing concealable, but generally speaking, long guns, so long as you're also in compliance with state, federal, and local law. Now, that leaves, what do we get to do through the common carriers? And like Richard said, this comes up because UPS has um, been, you know, in the midst of some controversy for firearm-related decisions. And that made us say, well, okay, so what's our option, right? right. So, Common carriers, UPS, FedEx, DHL, um, we have a federal regulation in the, in the CFR, the Code of Federal Regulation, that says when you are using a common carrier to ship handguns, right? Now, you could also ship your long guns, but long guns can go through the United States Postal Service. But you take your handgun to ship with a common carrier. We actually have a Code of Federal Regulation section that says you must inform that common carrier that you are shipping a firearm basically it is a it's a violation of federal law to not tell fedex right. or to not tell ups that you intend to ship a firearm that that's what's in your package um it, it's amazing to me because fedex is like the biggest drug dealer in the entire world and, and don't even know it th they have to right we all have to like <laughs> wink and know that they must know right but so anyway violation of federal law heaven forbid ship your cocaine all day long with the fedex but violation of federal law if you don't let them know there's a firearm in the package sounds great right yeah problem 
Yeah, so I'm and, kicking it to you for lots of problems today, Richard. Yeah. Give us the bad news. So, and this is, you know, going back to that controversy with UPS talking about, and just for those who haven't heard the news, uh, they have changed their policy that when they receive firearms from FFLs, those FFLs have to agree to basically allow them, you know, UPS to search their records, their customer records, and their firearms transaction records, uh, which is kind of a bizarre rule. And this kind of tipped us off that, hey, maybe there's more to the story here, and there is. And that's where this second part comes in. UPS, FedEx, DHL, they are no longer accepting firearms uh, to be shipped from private individuals. They are requesting and requiring that they always come through FFLs, and that has major implications. Yeah, and you know, this is actually, we're a little bit late to this. I mean, I guess I haven't, I mean, gosh, I haven't tried to ship a handgun actually ever now that I think about it. Um, but, you know, I always tell people, oh, UPS, UPS. And so it turns out that actually as of, I believe, September 1st of this year, so we're yep. a little bit behind, UPS changed this policy and will not allow private individuals to ship handguns or any firearms any longer. And so now as a private individual, and, you know, we'll take long guns out of the picture since long guns can be mailed through the USPS, but you're a private individual, you want to ship a handgun, which maybe you want to ship it back to the manufacturer. Maybe you want to mail it to yourself in a different state. These are the people I feel really, really sorry for, yeah. right? And this happens a lot. You've got a vacation home somewhere else. Um, you know, you are mailing this to yourself to have at your vacation home with you or on your trip, which is whatever you can even possibly imagine. Or you drive to a gun unfriendly state and you got to ship your gun back. Oh yeah. Minute. We've had to um, give that advice a couple times. Um, but Yes. So generally speaking, you could walk into that UPS, you could do it no longer. So now you have that handgun, you want to mail it somewhere legally, you're allowed by federal law to mail it, and you can't because USPS against the law and UPS, FedEx, DHL have caved to what I understand is just essentially letters by anti-gun senators right. and said, we will no longer accept firearms. And so as the private individual, you are totally out of luck now. I mean, you have to find an FFL dealer. Um, FFL dealers are generally going to ship to other FFLs. They're generally going to ship to manufacturers. Yeah, you're not going to find an FFL shipped to a private individual in another state. Yeah, I mean, that's what, and you know, maybe and may, uh, if there are FFLs out there and you're like, hey, I would definitely do that and I have done that and I will, comment, let us know. I would really love to hear, but- Don't do that. <laughs> my, <laughs> um, my experience has been just in speaking to people and when they go to FFLs and they want FFLs to make some of these mailings for them is that FFLs generally say no. Mm -hmm. um, and so as a private individual now, you are really, really out of luck. And this is something that, um, you know, our friend Bill Kirk over at Washington Gun Law calls it uh, the privatization of tyranny, which I think is, is a brilliant way to put it. But we are seeing, you know, think the credit card companies, the credit card processors. Uh, yeah, think about social media with, you know, the yes. government can't censor you, but they'll, you know, lean on these social media platforms to censor folks. I mean, um, I guess I don't know why we thought the Second Amendment would be any exception. No, I know. But so I'm. Mean, this is what we have now. And again, you know, being all for um, corporate freedoms, um, we have corporate freedoms being used to oppress, which is just... Um, it's not something that I thought I would see happening as quickly as it's happening in particular right now. It's a, it's a disturbing trend. This just goes to show, I mean, this is another domino in, I mean, you hear us say it all the time, the gun registry, uh, filtering all transactions through FFLs, keeping these records indefinitely, making running all these FFLs out of business and forcing them to turn over their records to the ATF. I mean, this all seems just like one piece in a very much bigger and more sinister machine that we really have to be vigilant about. But that's what the purpose of government is, is to secure our rights. And it's not to, you know, I, I don't know what they think they're doing here, but this might be an area where government intervention would probably be justified. Yeah, I mean, that's what, you know, Richard and I were sitting around this morning saying, how do we fix this? Because, you know, generally it's like, this is America, right? If you don't like the way someone does business, you take that to a business who does it the way you want or start your own business, right? It's great. But when we look at things like common carriers and, you know, credit card companies and payment processors, I mean, how do you and I as the individuals actually start that sort of corporation 
I mean, we don't have any shot, right? I mean, we're not starting a, you know, related barbecue business that's, yeah. you know, I mean, I local. Start one and, <laughs> absolutely. But, you know, but we're not starting one that does barbecue better than the next guy, right? Sure. I mean, these are, you know, I mean, ask me to start an airline, right? I mean, uh, these are things that are, I mean, virtually impossible just for the average citizen to to do on their own. And so I think we have to rely on our legislators to yeah. come in and say, hey, private businesses, there are some things you can't do. Discriminating against firearms in the Second Amendment has to be one of those things, I think, or else um, there's no protections. Yeah. And so the folks that need to hear about this are your elected representatives on the state and federal level. You know, whenever we see the government push, publish a new law or new rule, everybody gets notice and comment periods. But when a private company wants to go publish their or change their terms of service, a lot of that stuff kind of flies under the radar. But talk to your representatives. Those are the folks that really need to hear about this. But we hope you enjoyed this discussion. If you did, consider subscribing, hitting that like button, and help us fight the anti-2A algorithm by sharing this video. And please question and comment below. Until next time, we're the Armed Attorneys.